Hi, my name is Stephen Sindoni. Thank you for tuning into the broadcast of Hollow Earth Location Revealed. In today's program, I will share with you a little known story that may prove my theory surrounding a hollow earth. As many of you already know, I have created a great number of YouTube videos pertaining to this subject. And it was through the course of my research that the mystery involving Eric the Red and his lost colony in Greenland held the key to unlocking the mystery of a hollow earth. Eskimo legends claim that Eric the Red and his colony traveled on a one-month journey north and discovered a new land. So it is only fitting that I begin my investigation in Greenland and follow the clues. The information can be found in wikipedia.com. The title of the story is 1968 Tool Air Base B-52 Crash. And here now is a slide from wikipedia.com, the free encyclopedia regarding the story. The 1968 Tool Air Base B-52 Crash, Tool Affair or Tool Accident, was an accident on January 21, 1968, involving a United States Air Force B-52 bomber. The aircraft was carrying four hydrogen bombs on a Cold War Chrome Dome Alert mission over Baffin Bay when a cabin fire forced the crew to abandon the aircraft before they could carry out an emergency landing at Tool Air Base. Six crew members ejected safely, but one who did not have an ejection seat was killed while trying to bail out. The B-52 bomber crashed onto sea ice in North Star Bay, Greenland, causing the nuclear payload to rupture and disperse, which resulted in widespread radioactive contamination. The flight departed on January 21, 1968 from the 380th Strategic Bomb Wing at Plattsburgh Air Force Base in upstate New York. The bomber crew consisted of five regular crew members, including Captain John Haig, the aircraft commander. Also aboard was a substitute navigator, Captain Curtis R. Chris, and a mandatory third pilot, Major Alfred DiMario. And the other members of the crew was as follows. Co-pilot Leonard Svetenko, Staff Sergeant Calvin Snap, Major Frank Hopkins, radar navigator, and Captain Richard Max, which now made the total seven crew members. And now here now is the official story that the government wants you to believe. Before takeoff, the Mario placed three cloth-covered foam cushions on top of a heating vent under the instructor navigator's seat in the aft section of the lower deck. Shortly after takeoff, another cushion was placed under the seat. The flight was uneventful till the scheduled mid-air refueling from a KC-135 stratotanker, which had to be conducted manually because of error with the B-52G's autopilot. Approximately one hour after refueling, while the aircraft was circling above its designated area, Captain Hogg directed co-pilot Sitenko to take his rest period. His seat was taken by DeMario. And unbeknownst to the co-pilot, following the order of the captain and giving up his seat to DeMario would cause the end of his life. The crew was uncomfortable because of the cold, despite the heater's rheostat being turned up. DiMario opened an engine bleed valve to increase the cabin temperature by drawing additional hot air into the heater from the engine manifold. As a result of a heater's malfunction, the temperature drop between the engine manifold and the cabin's heating duct was negligible. During the next half hour, the cabin's temperature became uncomfortably hot and the stowed cushions ignited. A member of the crew reported smelling burning rubber and his search was mounted for the fire. Major Frank Hopkins, the radar navigator, searched the lower compartment twice before discovering the fire behind a metal box. He attempted to fight it with two fire extinguishers but could not put out the blaze. At 1522 hours Eastern Standard Time, approximately six hours into the flight and 90 miles south of Toole Air Force Base, Haig declared an emergency. He advised Toole Air Traffic Control that he had a fire on board and requested permission to perform an emergency landing at the airbase. Within five minutes, the aircraft's fire extinguishers were depleted, electrical power was lost, and smoke filled the cockpit to the point that the pilots could not read the instruments. As the situation worsened, the captain realized he would not be able to land the aircraft and advised the crew to prepare to abandon it instead. They awaited word from DeMario that they were over land. When he confirmed that the aircraft was directly over the lights of Tool Air Base, the four crewmen ejected, 
followed shortly thereafter by Haig and DiMario. The co-pilot who had been ordered to give up his seat by the captain, Leonard Servitenko, did not have an ejection seat and sustained fatal head injuries when he attempted to bail out to one of the lower hatches. The pilotless aircraft initially continued north, then turned left through 180 degrees and crashed onto sea ice in the North Star Bay about 7.5 miles or 12.1 kilometers west of Toul Air Base at 1539 hours Eastern Standard Time. The conventional high explosive components of four 1.1 megaton B-28 F-1 model hydrogen bombs detonated on impact spreading radioactive material over a large area in a similar manner to a dirty bomb. Supposedly, as the article goes on to read, a nuclear explosion was not triggered. The extreme heat generated by the burning of 225,000 pounds of aviation fuel during the five to six hours after the crash melted the ice sheet, causing wreckage and munitions to sink to the ocean floor. Interestingly enough, Haig, the captain, and DiMario parachuted onto the grounds of the air base and made contact with the base commander within 10 minutes of each other. They informed him that at least six members ejected successfully and the aircraft was carrying four nuclear weapons. Off-duty staff was mustered to conduct search and rescue operations for the remaining crew members. Three of the survivors landed within 1.5 miles or 2.4 kilometers of the base and were rescued within two hours. Captain Chris, who was the first to eject, landed six miles, 9.7 kilometers from the base. He remained lost on ice flow for 21 hours and suffered hypothermia in the minus 23 Fahrenheit degrees temperatures. But he survived by wrapping himself in a parachute. The resulting explosion and fire destroyed many of the components that the crash scattered widely in a 1 mile 1.6 kilometer by 3 mile 4.8 kilometer area. Parts of the bomb bay were found 2 miles 3.2 kilometers north of the impact area, indicating the aircraft started to break up before impact. The ice was disrupted at the point of impact, temporarily exposing an area of seawater approximately 50 meters or 160 feet in diameter. Ice flows in the area were scattered, upturned, and displaced. South of the impact area of 400 feet, 120 meter by 2,200 feet, 670 meter blackened patch was visible where fuel from the aircraft had burned. This area was highly contaminated with JP-4 aviation fuel and radioactive elements. These elements included plutonium, uranium, americium, and tritium. High levels of plutonium were found and registered in this area. American and Danish officials, Greenland is a Danish territory, immediately launched Project Crested Ice, informally known as Dr. Freeze Love a cleanup operation to remove the debris and contain environmental damage. Despite the cold, dark Arctic winter, there was considerable pressure to complete the cleanup and operation before the sea ice melted in the spring and deposited contaminants into the sea. A base camp named Camp Hunziker was created at the crash site. It included a heliport, igloos, generators, and communications facilities. The operation was conducted without natural light until February 14th when sunlight gradually began appearing. The United States Air Force worked with Danish nuclear scientists to consider the cleanup options. The resulting plan involved the removal of contaminated ice and wreckage to the United States for disposal. And here is where our story takes a bizarre twist and turn. In August of 1968, the United States military sent a Star 3 mini-submarine to the base to look for weapon debris, especially the uranium-235 Fisher Corps of a secondary. The purpose of the underwater search at Toul was obvious to the Danish negotiators, but at lower levels, however, the dives were surrounded by some confidentiality. In a review of evidence of missing bomb, the Danish Foreign Ministry reviewed 348 documents that the BBC obtained in 2001 under the Freedom of Information Act. In January 2009, Foreign Minister Per Stieg Moller commissioned a study by the Danish Institute for International Studies to compare the 348 documents with 317 documents released by the Department of Energy in 1994 in order to determine if the 348 documents contained any new information about an intact nuclear weapon at Toul. 
In August 2009, DIIS published its report, which refuted the assertions of the BBC. The report concluded that there was no missing bomb and that the American underwater operation was a search for the uranium-235 of the Fisher Corps of the secondary. For the first time, the report was able to present an estimate of the amount of plutonium contained in the pits of the primaries. And here is where the plot thickens. So I'll now pose a series of questions. Could Baffin Bay armor the North Atlantic Ocean with an area of 266,000 square miles, 689,000 square kilometers, extending southward from the Arctic for 900 miles or 1,450 kilometers between the Greenland Sea Coast and Baffin Island West, be the site where the opening is to the hollow Earth? I will now put up two photos for you, the viewer, to see that may show a hollow earth opening near Baffin Bay. Let us now examine the climate in Baffin Bay. The main visitor season in the Baffin region is May to August. Through May to August, temperatures average between 45 to 54 degrees, which makes it highly likely that Eric the Red could navigate with his ships and within 30 days find the new land. And in closing, I would like to pose the question, could our government be guilty of crashing a plane into the Arctic with nuclear weapons on it to blast a hole so that way they could get into the hollow earth? It does make one wonder. I'd like to thank everyone for watching Hollow Earth Location Revealed.